Hello, welcome to today's video. We're going to be looking at hyperkalemia. So as always, let's begin with the definition. So uh, the normal uh, potassium level in the blood is anywhere between 3.5 to 5.0 milliequivalents per liter. Uh, so anytime it's above 5.0 milliequivalents per liter, that's called hyperkalemia. And anytime it's below 3.5 milliequivalents per liter, we call that hypokalemia. So that's a pretty easy, straightforward definition that we can deal with. So now let's talk about the physiology of uh, potassium. Um, before we begin, let's just talk about its main function. So here's a cell, uh, and what I've drawn is uh, a cell with the sodium potassium ATPase pump. So what does this pump do? This pump pumps out three sodiums, and it pumps into potassiums. And this pump is very important because it maintains the uh, resting membrane potential. And so this is the sodium ATPase pump, and it maintains the resting membrane potential at negative 70 milliequivalents. And so the resting membrane potential is um, the difference in electrical potential compared to outside the cell from inside the cell. So overall, it's about negative 70, but of course, uh, certain cells that are excitatory uh, have different values. So resting membrane potential, every cell has it, but it's particularly important in two different types of cells. One of them is the muscle cell and the other one is in the neurons. And again, these are because they are, these cells are excitatory. So these are the ones that actually can uh, be excited. And what I mean by excitatory is they can trigger an action potential. And so that's why it's very important that the um, resting memory potential, especially for these cells, are between 3.5, wait, 3.5 and 2.0, uh, sorry, 3.5 to 5.0, uh, milliequivalents per liter. So if the potassium isn't in that range, you will have derangements in these cells. And if something like muscle cell, well, your heart is a muscle, the cardiac muscle. So your your heart, you're, you're starting to see changes in the heart muscle and maybe in the muscles in general, they become weaker. So because of such great importance, what we'll see is that there's, uh, the body has adapted to ways where it can quickly change the potassium level in the blood when needed. So when we're talking about the you know physiology, what we'll talk about, what we'll begin with is when you eat. So say you eat a banana, which has the potassium. Uh, obviously, that potassium will go into your intestines, and from the intestines, it'll finally make its way to the blood. So this is a blood vessel. So the potassium goes inside uh, the blood. Not only that, from the intestine, but you also will get glucose. So not only do you get when you absorb food, not only do you absorb the potassium, but you absorb glucose with it. So why am I mentioning glucose? As you already know, glucose will activate insulin. And so insulin is important because not only does it cause uptake of glucose into you know skeletal muscle and liver, but it also activates sodium potassium channels. It actually increases how many sodium potassium channels you have in particular in the liver and muscle. So I know classically you're, you're used to thinking of insulin for glucose, but you should also add potassium. It does help manage potassium. And of course, the reason is you want to make sure the potassium is maintained in 3.5 to 5.0. And so it's important that as soon as you eat, you push that into the cell uh, as soon as possible. So that's what you have there. So um, insulin overall pushes potassium into the cell. So now let's look at muscle. So here's a piece of muscle. We talked about, uh, you know, potassium does go inside the muscle. So obviously it's going to be uh, a reservoir for muscle. Um, the muscle has beta-2 receptors around their blood vessels. And these beta-2 receptors, and before we begin, during exercise, you actually have a loss of potassium. So during exercise, the muscle will release potassium. And when you release this uh, potassium, um, you will get hyperkalemia in the surrounding vessels and you'll get obviously hypokalemia within the muscle but what happens is the um, beta 2 receptors um, actually can activate the same sodium potassium channels that we talked about earlier and so it can activate sodium potassium ATPase channels and again this pushes potassium back in as well so not only does insulin push potassium back in but beta receptors uh, beta 2 receptors push potassium back into the cell uh, next, we'll talk about, so we've talked about th these factors. Now, when potassium goes through the blood vessel, it eventually makes it into the adrenal medulla. And when it gets, well, sorry, the adrenal gland. So when it gets to the adrenal gland, it triggers the release of aldosterone. So high potassium does trigger the release of aldosterone. 
And so when you, when you trigger aldosterone, that has effect on the principal cells. Uh, and the principal cells, uh, principal cells are found in the distal uh, convoluted tubules and in the collecting ducts. So what do these principal cells do? So let me draw a quick cell here. This cell is the actual principal cell that's found in the, uh, kidney, the nephron. So on the right side here, we'll make blood, and on the inside here is a lumen, and this is where urine is excreted. So uh, th this side here, we're talking about the, the tubular side. So of course here we have the same sodium potassium ATPase pump, which we all know is uh, very important uh, to maintain the rest of the potential in the general concentrations. So what will happen is it begins to pump sodium out of, the, uh, out of the cell into the blood. Well, you get a sodium deficiency here. And so what that does is that causes sodium to rush into the cell from the lumen. So now instead of having sodium outside, we have sodium on the inside. So now if you look at the circumstance here, we have sodium which has a positive charge and potassium which has a positive charge. Well, all of these positive charges will cause one of them to move. And since here is a potassium channel, potassium will exit the cell and so you'll have potassium on the outside rather than the inside so this is um and so and you end up what you're having is you have a release of uh you know loss of potassium into the urine and so uh, you get uh, net pot uh, sodium reabsorption and potassium secretion now so this is pretty easy so fair to say but what also happens in the principal cell is aldosterone can enter the cell and activate the aldosterone receptor and this aldosterone receptor will increase the sodium channels and the sodium potassium ATPase. So what, uh, what aldosterone will end up doing is um, more sodium will get pumped inside, more potassium will be pumped outside and so you'll get more potassium leaving and it can, uh, it can cause uh, more hypokalemia and uh, hypernatremia. So this is generally how potassium is maintained. What we'll do now is we'll, f we'll go ahead and look at clinical. Uh, I'm sorry, not clinical, uh, it causes. So we'll talk about the causes first and then we'll look at the clinical. So there's two different types of causes. Either it's uh, going to be potassium that's released from the cell or it's going to be um, due to decreased urinary excretion. So any one of these two factors uh, can cause hyperkalemia. So let's talk about release from cells. So the first factor would be catabolism. So catabolism can be caused by either burns, uh, some type of trauma, uh, or rhabdomyolysis. So in all, in all of these conditions, and even actually tumor lysis syndrome. So in all of these conditions, you have uh, catabolism of the cell or breakdown of the cell. And so all of the, um, all of the uh, potassium that was generally inside the cell then gets released into the blood, and so you get hyperkalemia. Uh, the second cause is due to cellular shift. Uh, and so what cellular shift means is um, the cell doesn't rupture like with catabolism. What actually happens is the potassium just decides to leave the cell and enter into the bloodstream. So one cause for this is acidosis. And so what does acidosis do? So here's a cell here. Um, so what happens is in acidosis, obviously we have a high concentration of hydrogen ions or uh, you know acidic ions outside the cell. And so what will happen is because there's low hydrogen ions inside the cell and high uh, outside the cell, um, a lot of these cells will begin to start moving inwards. So you'll get less cells outside and you'll have more hydrogen ions inside. And so then again, the potassium ions inside, well, there's way too much positivity here. So then these to offset the uh, influx of hydrogen ions, then the potassium ions will leave and cause a net hyperkalemia. So you'll get hyperkalemic acidosis. So the other cause can be hyperosmolality. Uh, and so with hyperosmolality, you just have uh, more osmotic molecules in the bloodstream, so that'll push the potassium out, as well as other, other things. Uh, insulin deficiency as well, and we mentioned already uh, when we're talking about the physiology, uh, this is due to the fact uh, that uh, insulin causes to push in, push in potassium. So if you don't have it, then there's nothing that's keeping it in. And real quick, acidosis, remember, uh, just to point out, in acidosis, it's only metabolic acidosis. Uh, not respiratory acidosis. Respiratory acidosis would not, will not cause hyperkalemia, only metabolic acidosis will. So just a quick thing you should, you should know there. Uh, and finally, there are some drugs that can cause uh, you know, the potassium to move out of the cell rather than staying in the cell. And these are drugs like digitalis, which is a sodium potassium channel blocker, uh, beta blockers, um, remember beta, uh, beta, two, uh, beta 2 agonists, uh, 
do cause cell to go do do cause potassium to go into the cell. So if you have beta blockers, they won't do that. And uh, you can also have and it's not a drug, but RBC transfusions in management. Uh, and that's because obviously the RBCs can sometimes hemolyze inside the body and then cause hyperkalemia. So that's pretty much you know all the causes that are you know due to some type of release from the cell. Uh, the other cause would be decreased urinary excretion. And as we already talked about, aldosterone plays a vital role in uh, removing um, potassium outside of the, out of the body. And so anything that decreases aldosterone or inhibits aldosterone will cause hyperkalemia. So um, decreased secretion, you're usually talking about Addison's, which is the primary uh, adrenal insufficiency, uh, or it can be due to some drugs. And so these are drugs uh, such as uh, spironolactone, uh, iplerinone. Uh, you also have uh, triemterine and amylaride. And so these are all uh, known as uh, potassium sparing diuretics and so just from their name you can tell that they will not uh, cause potassium to be wasted and it, instead it'll cause it to be uptake so th these are kind of their function and when we use these drugs we're kind of actually using it for the fact that it will cause uh, potassium retention uh, on top of these we also have ACE inhibitors and um, NSAIDs. NSAIDs can also cause decreased release of aldosterone so these are these are due to decreased release of aldosterone uh, the other is going to be uh, renal tubular acidosis um, specifically type 4, which affects the uh, principal cells. And so in, in, this, in this type of disorder, uh, you have decreased sodium reabsorption in principal cells. And so since you have decreased sodium reabsorption, uh, there will be less potassium secretion. And so, um, and if we go back up here, here's the principal cells. So if you have decreased, uh, if, if this is uh, blocked here, you have decreased sodium coming in, well then you're going to have um, less potassium leaving and so you're going to have an uh, accumulation of potassium in the blood. So what can cause this? Uh, an obstructive uropathy uh, can definitely cause this, uh, lupus nephritis uh, and uh, sickle cell disease. So if you see hyperkalemia in these type of patients, it might be because they're going into re re renal tubular acidosis. And finally, any acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease, these can also cause hyperkalemia and that's just because they have a low GFR and so you know they're not urinating much they got oliguria and so they're just not able to filter the potassium to begin with um, and so then you're going to get uh, potassium retention uh, from the renal side uh, and before we begin there are some causes called spurious causes these are also known as pseudo hyperkalemia and these are situations when the patient is actually have normal potassium level but there's some problem with the actual uh, you know, lab findings or the way you've, you've taken the blood that will make it seem as if they have hyperkalemia. And uh, the first major one is hemolysis. So if there's any hemolysis in the tube, that's going to cause release of the potassium that's normally within the cell. Um, also, thrombocytosis can have that and leukocytosis. So if you have a patient with um, high potassium levels and, you know, the, bl the blood work shows high potassium level, but everything seems normal or it seems off, you might want to think of these. Uh, and also the tourniquet. So cause sometimes when you put the tourniquet on for too long, um, this can cause uh, some type of cell ischemia and, and you can lose some cells and that can eventually lead to hyperkalemia. But of course the patient is normal. This is just uh, due to how you're taking the blood. And generally with these, if you're suspecting this, just take another blood reading and um, you, know, you should be able to figure it, figure it out or not. Okay, so um, that takes up that. So we will now look at the clinical aspects of uh, hyperkalemia. Uh, so the first thing the patient will notice is some type of muscle weakness, and it might even be paralysis. Uh, and this starts ascending, so it'll begin with the leg, it'll go up to the trunk, and eventually it'll get to the arms. And if, you know, this kind of mimics Guillain-Barre, uh, which kind of has the same pattern of kind of ascending uh, paralysis. So that's something to keep in mind. Now this muscle weakness, it won't lead, to, it very rarely does it lead to diaphragmatic weakness. So it's not fatal and generally it is reversible. So uh, this is just, if you kind of see muscle weakness and you know, that's just something to think of. Now what is very important to discuss is cardiac changes. Um, the first thing that you'll notice is going to be ECG changes. So here is an ECG of a patient who does have hyperkalemia. And so what you notice is, you kind of notice these little peaked uh, you know, waves here, uh, and this is called um, peak T wave, hyperacute T wave, sorry, hyperacute T waves, also called tense uh, T waves or, you know, peak T waves, and these are one of the signs that uh, the patient does have hyperkalemia. And what you also notice is there's no P wave, uh, 
So there should be somewhere P waves there, but you can't find them. So P waves do disappear. Um, on top of that, you can also get arrhythmias. Um, and these arrhythmias can be sinus bradycardia. And you can actually see that here. Um, the patient uh, you know, has, is, it has a really slow heart rate. Uh, 37 actually says mentioned right there 37 so uh, but they can also get something more serious such as ventri ventricular tachycardia or even ventricular fibr fibrillation and eventually asystole and so this tells this shows you right here very very serious hyperkalemia can uh, can stop the heart pretty much and so uh, it's very uh, you know very serious condition that needs to be treated right away uh, also there could be some uh, conduction abnormalities and these conduction abnormalities can either be left bundle branch block right bundle branch block uh, you can also get a bifascicular block as well and AV block. So um, because it's, it's throwing off the whole action potentials, it tends to be weaker, and so you get these blocks that uh, begin to form. Uh, and finally, you can get decreased urine acid uh, excretion. And what the reason is because um, potassium does not allow ammonia excretion. And so if you don't have ammonia excretion, then you cannot have potassium excretion. So that's the real quick pathophysiology there, um, and, and eventually that'll lead to metabolic acidosis. So now that we've discussed that, um, we can now talk finally about the management. Uh, and so the management of um, hyperkalemia first depends on uh, symptom, whether it's symptomatic or not. So the first thing you want to do after, and by the way, when we're talking about hyperkalemia, you have to first rule out any spurious causes. So again, you, you have to make sure that the blood was drawn correctly and there wasn't any thrombocytosis or leukocytosis and, and things like that. So after you ruled it out and you've said, you know, this is hyperkalemia, the next thing you want to definitely check is whether there's uh, EC changes, ECG changes or no ECG changes. Now, if you have ECG changes or say, for example, the potassium is greater than 7.0 milliequivalents per liter or the patient is symptomatic, um, there's actually some things you need to do right away. And um, the first thing you need to do is you need to give either calcium chloride or calcium gluconate. And this is because um, this will help stabilize the heart membrane and prevent you know, some type of uh, ventricular tachycardia or asystole. And then afterwards, you want to put them in cardiac monitoring and you want to look at the heart. And you know, if, you ever see, if you start to see any of those T wave changes or anything like that, you want to go ahead and treat right away. After you've stabilized the heart, then you could move on and try to fix the actual uh, potassium level and that can be done first with IV insulin and glucose and so as you already know insulin uh, pushes potassium into the cell and you just give glucose so that they don't become hypoglycemic. Um, beta 2 agonists also help as we discussed before uh, beta 2 pushes potassium into the cell so this is used. Uh, diuretics especially such as like loop diuretic or any the diuretics they help remove potassium via the kidneys. Uh, there, are also some, uh, there are also some potassium binding resins that you can use um, Hemodialysis is another option if it becomes kind of refractory to treatment and, and, you, and you, nothing seems to be working. And if they have acidosis, then you might want to consider sodium bicarb, um, and that'll help as well. So uh, these are your kind of treatments there to kind of fix the actual potassium levels. And so um, if you have no ECG changes and it's between 6.0 and 7.0, well, that's generally what you want to do. So uh, the only difference between these two is here you kind of want to stabilize the heart first and then go on to decreasing uh, potassium levels and if and if it's just 6.0 7.0 no symptoms and no ECG changes then you just want to go ahead and just address the potassium level issues and finally if say it's between 5.0 and 6.0 um, these don't necessarily need any type of immediate treatment uh, you can try to maybe change their diet uh, especially in elderly sometimes if they're eating a lot of fruits and vegetables and they have some minor kidney issues sometimes that can cause it to go up uh, so maybe just changing that can help now if they're taking some drugs uh, you can go ahead and try to just stop the drug however um, one thing you want to keep in mind is um, with ACE inhibitors and ARBs um, the, especially in patients who might be diabetic or have kidney disease these pa the, the ACE inhibitors and ARBs are so helpful uh, that you do actually want to try to keep them on it if possible and so what you'll do is uh, you'll give them a lower dosage of the drug just so they're on it or you can try to add a diuretic that'll help remove some of the potassium so this kind of highlights how important ACE inhibitors and uh, ARBs can be for these uh, diabetic patients and these patients with uh, chronic kidney disease so and finally you can also think about giving albuterol as well which is one of the uh, 
beta 2 agonist. So uh, this kind of wraps up our discussion here about hyperkalemia. Hope you learned a lot and I'll see you in a future video. Bye.